and stand by. Good evening and welcome to the school committee meeting this evening, Monday, February 22nd. The meeting is being recorded for LCTV, it's being aired live and being live streamed through longmeadow.org. This meeting was also posted as required by open meeting law. And we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Longmeadow School Committee maintains educational policies that foster continuous improvement by challenging and supporting all children in a safe and caring learning environment, enabling them to reach their highest potential and to become productive citizens. Through effective communication and positive relationships, the Longmeadow School Committee will make informed decisions in the best interest of the students, the schools, and the Longmeadow community. Is no, there? I don't think, I think that the word no, no. is missing. I've heard right. that. So we don't have any There's correspondence. No. Any visitor comments? No? All right, so we'll move right into <laughs> the superintendent's report. All right. Uh, the uh, Wind Ensemble went to Hawaii and played on the U.S. Arizona to celebrate the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. So I know that they had a wonderful trip and congratulations to our students and staff for being invited in representing Longmeadow so well. The Tech Committee has met to begin the three-year plan. We have a, t a committee comprised of um, teachers, parents, and administrators. So we look forward to seeing a new three-year plan developed. Lynn Lyons was a speaker that was brought on by the Special Programs Committee. She was a huge success. I think we had over 400 parents she that attended. It was um, about anxious kids, anxious parents, how to stop the cycle of worry. It was, she was fantastic. She spoke for two hours, very well received. People really enjoyed it. So uh, th special thanks to the Special Programs Committee who really found her and uh, has done an excellent job of bringing Longmeadow some sensational speakers this year. Blueberry had their simple machines. It's always fun to see. This, fit, this year's fifth grade did um, some really great creative inventions. I would say the decorations were particularly noticeable this year in, terms, in, in comparison to other years. So it was, it was a great show. Room 232, which is our special education room at the high school, featured a Valentine's Day party. This is uh, fantastic because the students learn how to socialize, greet people, and how to, be, um, how to behave in a social situation. So that was great. And then today I attended a STEM meeting. I represent the superintendents on a statewide committee. It's with business leaders, um, and we're going to be adding on some, um, some college level people to talk about what's happening in the state with STEM and how we can really uh, do more to bring STEM education to schools throughout the Commonwealth as well as nationally. And that's it. Any questions? I just wanted to thank you for putting together that special programs committee. I know it was new this last year and we had so many parents involved with it we had I mean the first meeting we had over 20 parents yep. we did the survey the parents all met um, recommended the speakers you know and the first two were I thought they were very well attended but that this last speaker was truly something I feel like the district really wanted to see that the parents in the district I've seen um, social media conversations about it um, people just were loving the presentation. They were ordering her books on Amazon, buying her books here. They want to form book groups <laughs> to wow. read the book and talk about it amongst each other. So I feel like we've, we've kind of done something really good here. And I just wanted to, I know that it wouldn't have happened if you didn't, you didn't, you didn't support the special uh, programs committee. So I wanted to just say thank well, you thank for you that. thank you for coming up with the idea because I, I knew <laughs> you encouraged me to do it and it's well worth it. But I'm excited because next year we're going to have speakers on boys and girls, uh, the way of boys, Anthony Rao and I forget the woman speaker, but we're lining up some really fantastic speakers for next year. Yeah, I'm, so. I'm excited. I've thank read. you. I'm, I'm delighted with the speakers that we had this year. It's a yeah. great mm -hmm. kickoff. All right, just a couple things. Um, to follow up on the request from last meeting to have a joint meeting with the select board, I have been in touch with Chair, um, Chairman Richard Foster. He is looking um, 
almost definitely tentatively scheduling for next Monday, um, February the 29th at 7 p.m. here. He, um, when I reached out to him, he had said that he was trying to draft a meeting um, just for select board to discuss budget in general. So he thought that that would be a perfect time for us to come and, and have our presentation and conversation. So he should be letting me know um, definitely tomorrow or Wednesday once he hears back from one or two of his committee members. But he said as far as everything looks right now, that should be a go. So I did want to report back to everyone on that. Um, so that day, as we were discussing before the meeting, I could probably be there around 745 mm -hmm. or 8 at the latest. Um, so I don't know if he's going to have us on first or. I can ask. I can ask that we, you know. Do like at eight o'clock. We come in at like eight or something. Okay. What was that? Come in at like eight, if we if we could start it. Okay. Yeah, I mean it's. I mean if everybody else can make it, then, you know, you should do it when everybody can make it. But I know I can't be there until a little bit later. Okay, and I do know that. Um, he's cons you know I, I don't know what else he's having on the schedule whether he'll have. Um, visitor comments or not, or how he's planning on structuring it, but I can certainly ask. Can I just ask, is it one of the regular meetings? No, they. Um, it's the fifth Monday oh, okay. of the month, so it's right. not a regular meeting for either one of us. Oh, okay. um, he was looking to take advantage of the fact that there was a fifth Monday so that they could have a, a meeting devoted to budget. Okay. Um, and then just as since we won't meet again before these next two events are coming up, I just wanted to mention um, the Long Meadow Police Department um, and Fire Department and, and others are co-sponsoring the presentation on March the 1st from 7 to 9 at the high school um, on the local opiate crisis. Um, to discuss that, I know Senator Lesser will be there, we're at fire police, schools, um, so that is coming up. And also the district's Imagine concert at Symphony Hall. It's is not called Imagine anymore. It's not called Imagine. No. Okay. But it's a it's a very nice event. I just I had just looked on the district calendar before yeah. I left and it was Sorry. Still listed as Imagine. I, no, there's been fine. some discussion about why it was changed. So the name was changed. So the district wide <laughs> concert is at Symphony Hall, whatever its Sorry. name may be, on March the 9th at 7 p.m. and I know from past experience that that has been an awesome, awesome yeah. presentation. So, I on the ninth, the finance committee is meeting. Um, we will yep. be presenting to them. We're on their agenda for eight o'clock, so that okay. we can attend the beginning of the concert at least. Okay, so we're going to try and do both. Mm -hmm. right. Select board and okay. Do we have a quorum? I can't be there because my son's in the concert. Yeah, we won't be. I won't well, be finance here committee is generally it's presented by the superintendent just, you know. and the chair. Oh, Normally, okay, so just present to finance committee. If you if you'd like to attend, you're certainly more than welcome. Okay. But traditionally, it's just been superintendent. Tom, you come to that one too, right? Yes, I do. Yes. <laughs> Forward to it. Right. So generally, it's just that um, presentation to the finance committee. And is that? Where is that meeting going to happen? Did you say at the fire firehouse? The fire station. Okay. Yeah. So those were the only things that I, I wanted to mention because I know they're coming up before one to follow up and then the others are coming up prior to our, our next meeting. Um, the time that they're starting that finance meeting is at seven. They start at seven, um, but the chair has graciously put us till eight so that we could because of the conflict with the concert and that they only meet once a month. Yep. Um, and we need to meet with them before. prior to the budget. So the meeting on the 29th with the board, can all of you make it at 7? I think I'm just so. wondering if we have a quorum. Um, maybe. I'm not sure. Well, and I don't know about Michael and John. I can make it. I mean, I'll definitely be here if right, it's you'll just like be 745, later. but if they, if it's before that, you'll need four people somehow. I can probably, I just have to check okay. another calendar. Oh, I'm sorry, you mean the meeting on the, the 29th? The 20th, oh, okay. Next um, month? Yeah, I can make it. Okay. Sorry. So I'm I'll check with John and Michael about their availability. I have to check. <laughs> 
and then um, once I get confirmation from Richard, I'll email everyone to let them know a definitive time. Okay. Um, so moving along, I know that we've got um, committee reports, and I know some of the other subcommittees have met, but I did want to um, acknowledge that it, it is time, Bobby and Peter, that we can vote to disband the school building committee officially. And so, um, because they have Oh. I'm, I'm sorry, Bobby was going to come, so I don't know if he's oh, just he coming this late. evening. He was going to just talk to us. Okay, so well then we'll we wait put on that. that. Off till Bobby comes. Absolutely, Great. I didn't know Bobby was coming. Good. Sorry. So we'll wait on that. Um, I know Michael's not here this evening. Policy review. Um, our committee has been meeting, reviewing the policies because they, you know, in a orderly, logical fashion. And this past time, we were working on all of the policies that are in Section B, as in boy. Um, there are a couple changes that we're recommending, and so these will be presented for first reading, posted on the district's website for the next 30 days to solicit any input. One of and Russ, maybe you can help me fill in of what the differences are on policy BBA, school committee powers and duties. I think Michael just bolded the new. Okay, so, so what is changing is that in paragraph two, it shall be the duty of the committee to employ the superintendent, associate assistant superintendents, business manager, and director of pupil services. That was just a, a clarification. Um, in that policy, so that was the only change there. Policy BCA, school committee member ethics. Again, paragraph two, the acceptance of a code of ethics implies the understanding of the basic organization of school committees under the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, including but not limited to the state ethics law and its requirements. MGL chapter 268. So including but not limited to is is what was clarified in that policy. And then um, policy BDE subcommittees of the school committee. It was just added. Um, it stated the school committee will have no standing committees with the exception of the finance subcommittee and we've added the policy review subcommittee and the operations subcommittee. Um, so those two committees were added in as regularly standing committees along with finance subs. So those were the three policies that had minor changes made to them. I'm gonna fix the misspelling. Right, <laughs> yeah, I just saw that, <laughs> of that misspelling. But um, these will be posted for the next 30 days. If you have any comments, um, there's a form on the website to comment upon those. Now I know you had. Did, this, uh, did you notice the uh, period instead of the? The period should be a comma after finance subcommittee. Right, and the sub the spelling of subcommittee after operations. So. <laughs> okay. I, did you want me to? Yes, because I know you had some committee updates as well. I don't know, Liz, do you want to talk to it at all? I was just going to talk about the um, energy committee that we met with Marie Angelides. Um, go ahead. Um, we, we met with Marie Angelides uh, a couple weeks ago now, um, and we are co trying to come up with a mission statement for the committee, and our task is to come up with a green policy um, for the school committee in general. She, we, we wanted to come up with a green policy for the district um, maybe that talks to conservation, limit con consumption, search for, um, that we search for grants and we uh, work on recycling. Um, and then we are going to be uh, coming up with a project which we feel like we've kind of got right now. Um, we're looking for, we're looking into solar panels for the um, schools and hopefully municipal buildings as well. Um, we had a representative from Johnson Controls come in 
um, and we're going to talk with him a little bit more about coming into the and looking at the schools and giving us an idea for <coughs> solar panels or um, it doesn't cost anything for them to come in and, and tell us how we can um, uh, have, have some efficiencies with solar panels on the schools. Um, I'm trying to think, was there anything else that we had? Um, but basic, the, the one thing that we wanted to, to do was to come up with a green policy for the schools. And I haven't had a chance to go through our policy manual and see if we have one already, but that was the main thing that. Yeah, I mean, we do have a green policy. I think that this is more of like, more of an energy consumption yeah. um, policy that we want to reduce it. Um, and the other thing is that she wanted to um, get a baseline and we were going to work with Tom and finding a baseline of how much energy we use and then track it over the years to see how we can lower it and so we can set a goal you know let's say right. our energy consumption over the next five years 10% or something like that because we've done the we did the green the LED lights over the last year mm -hmm. and so I guess she says she wants to compare um, FY13 to see where we are now to see where we can make some improvements. Okay. So that's. See if so we is this going to be a subcommittee of the school committee, or how are we, how are we doing? So that? you know, I was kind of I I don't know what we did with it, but Marie actually posted the meeting for tomorrow just to be safe. Um, yeah, it kind of started out as like a joint um, collaboration between. Um, like a working group. Like a working group, right? But I think we've always just called it a the energy subcommittee or the green. We called it a green team. We called it different things, and then I think last year we voted who would be on it. And I think Russ, you're on it, right? Instead well, that's of what I'm kind of wondering is whether I should be going or not. I mean, I, I think you're on it, right? Well, Isn't I'm on that the part of operation? I'm not sure that that's really what you're doing, or if it's something different, which is fine if, if it's. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to know if I need to show up. <laughs> Well, if you'd like to come, definitely. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, is it posted as a green committee? Or no, it's posted as an energy. Energy committee is what we had come up with as a last year, I think, as an official name. So that I think Marie needed to get an official name, Marie Angelides, for the select board to have. So would that be the two of you and Michael? Is that? That's what it was originally. Right. So maybe we should leave it that way. Okay. I don't know. Because if Michael's going to go, I can't go because that'd be a quorum of the whole committee. I don't know if he's going. He's I don't know. Have he's you heard from him? No. Is it tomorrow during the day? Yeah, it's at it's a two, two o'clock tomorrow. <clears throat> My guess would be not, but I don't want to make assumptions for him. We can find out if you're interested in switching to be on that committee since you're on the what is it operations and that's part of the I'm green on operations and green committee. So anyway, we don't really need to take. I mean, I just. Okay. We could talk about it after, I guess. Okay. Now, did you want policy sub to be working on a so yeah that was energy <coughs> consumption because I know we're going to be meeting coming up. Yes. Um, so we can certainly add that to our agenda. Do you have? So I had written down um, conservation, limit consumption. consumption, recycling, and grants. Right. And all of it regarding energy consumption, and you said we already have a green policy, so we can look at that. Uh -huh. Just maybe add it into that or something. Okay, yeah, so we'll it's I'll kind put of different, or maybe a sub thing though. Yeah, yeah. Maybe a sub letter of it or, or something, right. but we can definitely put that on on our agenda because okay. there's enough time to do that. Okay, we'll bring that back. Any were there any other meetings, subcommittee meetings that happened that I missed? Okay. No. All right, so we'll still hold off on school building committee. Um, we do have school choice on the agenda. Bobby texted, he's stuck at work, so he can't come tonight. Oh. So I, I would recommend that you both close it out and he can come do a presentation on it another night. Absolutely. Um, so with that, you know, the school building committee that has worked many, many long years to complete the Longmeadow High School building project that since they are a subcommittee of the school committee and now their work is done um, we do need to vote to disband them so I would entertain a motion is that 
I move that the school committee disband the school building committee, which oversaw the Longmeadow High School building project. Second. 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 All right. So, and, and like Marie said, you know, Bobby will come and, and give us a presentation at a later date. Sorry, you're stuck at work, Bobby. Um, so, all those in favor? Okay. And we thank you for all of the many years and hard work that all the members of the committee put into that. I just would like to second that. There were at least um, a meeting a month that went on for seven years, I think, at least that this committee was together. We had representatives from engineers and architects and all kinds of people from the community. It was a large committee. And they really dedicated themselves to making sure that we had the best high school possible for the most um, price efficiency that we could possibly get. And the high school is absolutely amazing. And without the building committee, that never would have happened. So absolutely. we thank them for their years of service. Yes. All right, so um, we do have school choice for 2016-17 on the agenda. Um, the administration is recommending accepting school choice students at the kindergarten level only this year, meaning this past year. Um, right, Tom? Yeah. When, when you're saying this year, I'm just, you know. It's coming year. This, well, this year we accepted four students in the full day program and are making the same recommendation for 2016-17. Now, the this is wrong on yeah. The motion, so you'll have to change them. I'm sorry. The years are wrong on the motion. Okay. So just update them. Okay. And this recommendation is coming from Finance Sub. Is that correct? Yep. Yes. yes. All right. So, can I have a motion? Um, I move on the recommendation of the Finance Subcommittee. The school committee accept students in the school choice program for the 2016-2017 school year as follows. Grade level, kindergarten, full day, four seats. Oh, sorry. If there is a fee associated with the full day kindergarten program, parents of the school choice students would be expected to pay that fee. So second. we have a motion. We have a second? Second. Okay. Discussion? <coughs> So, so what was the rationale of the finance subcommittee for this recommendation? We, in the past, we had um, medical and school choice students that came into the high school, and we found that there was a gap in learning that uh, was, that, that made it difficult for students to transition well to Long Meadow. So I think the, re the past practice over the past several years has been to bring students into kindergarten so that there's a more level playing field and that they can be successful. How about some of the lower grades besides kindergarten? I think it's still have the same type of issue? I, I think we would. Th there's, there's a gap there. And uh, I think for every year, the gap grows. So I think it's better to, to bring students in when they can be most successful. And the four would be throughout the three buildings. So we could have. It's possible we look where the lowest enrollment is. So sometimes they go to one building and sometimes they they spread out throughout the district. Okay, so there's no, we don't give them the option of trying to pick a building. We no. just tell them where they're going. Okay. So do they pay the kindergarten fee plus the $14,000? No, the choice School. program is oh. a state program. So the district would receive $5,000 for each student from the state. Okay. So the sending district has their chapter 70 funds reduced by the number of um, outplaced choice students they have and receiving districts get the money through basically uh, the grant sort of it's paid to the town but we receive a base of five thousand dollars per student and then if there are special ed services we also get um, some incremental increase above that amount and the four is based on our enrollment projection as far as what we think we have for space. Is that we, we've been doing four because we can make sure that we can focus on those four students and help them be successful. Uh, we, the kindergarten enrollment is always one that, that bursts um, as the summer yeah. goes on. The census is not accurate, so we feel that four is the appropriate number. We don't want to be in a position of having to add on a teacher because we, over, we underestimated the number of long middle students. Yeah. Any clear questions? <coughs> all right, seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All of those in favor? Okay. And then two, um, the METCO for 2016-17, 
The lottery for Medco seats will be done in April of 2016. Available seats will be filled at random by grade level. Mm -hmm. Currently, we have 35 Medco students in Longmeadow. Four of the Medco students are seniors. The administration is recommending acceptance of four Medco students at the kindergarten level only. School placement will be determined by the administration at a later date. So, may I have a... I move on the recommendation of the Finance Subcommittee that the school committee accept students in the MECO program for 2016-2017 school year as follows. Kindergarten, full day, number of seats four. Do we have a second? second. Motion and a second. <coughs> Discussion? So, so how does the MECO program work if there's a fee for the second half of the day in kindergarten? I know that's not the direction, but we had any other motion. I defer to Tom. Yeah, the students in the MECO program do not pay the fee. Okay. Um, they are here through a grant we receive uh, depending upon the total funding at the state level but there's a per, per student amount that we are given plus a certain amount is designated for transportation purposes okay. so there there is no fee for those students any other questions seeing none I'll call for a vote all those in favor Okay. We have preliminary field trip requests. Um, so we've got three different motions. Michelle? I move on the recommendation of the superintendent that the school committee approve the preliminary request to secure prices and make arrangements for students from Long Middle High School to travel to Ireland and England in April of 2017. A second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? I move on the recommendation of the superintendent that the school committee approve the preliminary request to secure prices and make arrangements for students from Long Meadow High School to travel to Barcelona, Spain in July of 2017. Second. A motion and a second. All those in <coughs> favor? I move on the recommendation of the superintendent that the school committee approve the preliminary request to secure prices and make arrangements for students from Long Meadow High School to travel to Italy in February of 2017. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? <coughs> we also have two overnight field trip requests for school committee consideration, which would take students outside of the country. Both are for students from Longmeadow High School to travel during April 2016 vacation. I move on the recommendation of the superintendent that the school committee approve the overnight field trip request for students from Long Meadow High School to travel to Italy and Greece departing on Thursday, April 14th, 2016 through the return date of Friday, April 22nd, 2016. A second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? I move on the recommendation of the superintendent that the school committee approve the overnight field trip request for students from Long Meadow High School to travel to France departing on Thursday, April 14th, 2016 through the return date of Friday, April 22nd, 2016. A second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? We also have textbook adoption. Um, Long Meadow High School is bringing textbooks forward for consideration. The textbooks will be available for review over the next two weeks. And we will not be voting on the textbook adoptions until the March 14th school committee meeting. The textbooks are for Geometry Common Core by Pearson and Geometry by <coughs> Glencoe. Books are at the high school level and one is for the um, Geometry, what did we say? They're both high school. They're both, they're both mm -hmm. high school. Yeah, different, different, different levels sections. Different yeah. levels in high school. One is the 320, one is the 322. Both are for the high school geometry. And 324. And 324. Yeah. And 324. This one's 324. No, the other no, one is. No, the other way. 320 and 322, and this one's 324. Gotcha. So, Diane, you'll have those in your office yeah. if anyone wants to review those. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can I just ask? question about that because I'm sure. not going to read those. Uh, <laughs> so could you explain a little bit about why we're looking at those two textbooks as opposed to yeah. other ones I'm sure you looked at? Um, well, actually they made the choice last year, uh, but we had some other math texts come forward last year that were um, more important as far as the high school math 
committee was, or math um, department was concerned. So um, it, it's because of the collapsing and compacting of the curriculum, and they need to get a book that was reflect the Common Core. And that's going why. I'm trying to align all of their curriculum to Common Core, the math Common Core standards. And the old book didn't do that very well. Okay. So is it pacing and content? Is both. It the, yeah. It's both. And the content on the MCAS has changed? I, I, MCAS part. Well, it's <laughs> also yeah. changing still, though. The well, con the content yeah. shouldn't be changing too much. The content changes to reflect the Common Core, supposedly. So the tests that are given are, are a reflection of the Common Core. So you're looking at... MCAS 2.0, the assumption is that it's going to follow Common Core to a large extent. That's the assumption. Yes. Yes. Those else? are the only questions I have for now. Okay. And if I could just add, there will be um, a request for $35,000 <laughs> to purchase the books at some point. They're looking for 250 copies of the uh, 320 and 322 course book and 75 copies of the 324 course book. So, okay. And where, where would that come from? So well, probably that's school that's choice, but we will have to see where we are later in the year. Okay. So is this an example of something that we might not have budgeted for? Yeah, these are the type of curriculum purchases that uh, we have either used end of year funds or school choice purchases that are non recurring, um, but that come up and we try to fund out of those one time sources. We also have elementary science coming up right. this year to be funded, hopefully. That isn't designated in our budget right, right. now. Correct. And that price tag? That will be a much, much larger higher. Price, price well, like tag last year, the the math, math was, was about 100,000? 110 or yeah, so. Yeah, And that wasn't budgeted as well. Correct. And so we can figure the science will be around the same. 75 to 100 maybe? Yeah. yeah. So if we have these, we have a timeline that we re, we, we look at these. Like I, The I, curriculum the reviews. Curriculum we have reviews. a curriculum review cycle. It, it fluctuates, to be honest with you, depending on you know when standards get released and things like that. You, you almost can't predict a five-year cycle for everything or a ten-year cycle for everything because things don't come out on a regular basis. So, you know, like we review always. We're always under constant revision of our curriculum. But the big ones are when we have new standards released and, and things like that. So science just came out. You know, math has been in the works. Is there eventually a social studies or something? That's the threat. Yeah. Well, I'm just trying to figure out how to include these in our budget going forward because $100,000 is not an easy thing as we've seen to try and find. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just trying to figure out how in the coming years we can plan plan better, I guess. I mean, if we can. Yeah, there used to be a line <laughs> item, mm -hmm. but it got cut, I'd say, um, seven years ago. Yeah, six, seven years ago mm -hmm. when, you know, again, we were going through a budget cycle and there weren't enough funds. Um, was 25 or 50,000 I don't recall exactly the the amount for the line item but that was one of the one of the reductions that was made so and our our curriculum was stagnant because we didn't have the resources to update it so uh, we've been fortunate to have the ability with end a year or school choice to make the purchases we've had but there's no guarantee that that'll always be a, a source right. available to us so it's the end of year funds, which is what we would typically turn back to the town. Correct. Whereas, like two years ago, it was somewhere around three hundred thousand. Where last year it was about fifty thousand because we ended up having to use the money mm -hmm. for things that come up, like the hundred thousand dollar mm -hmm. math curriculum. Correct. And Sue, so do you know offhand how old the current geometry books are that they're using? I don't know how old they are. I, I know that my daughter's is falling apart, so it's got pretty old. I saw probably at least 11 I was going to say names. about 10 years. Yeah, <laughs> in the yeah. book. So, because like. so, I, I don't want people thinking either. I mean, well, I, yeah, I appreciate your point, and I, I think that's a point that definitely needs to be made. But I also think, too, that, you know, it's, it's not that we're going out every three years during review cycles and purchasing new books. It's these books have been around mm -hmm. for oh, yeah. quite some time. No, I feel like we do need, it's something we need to do. I just, I guess I'm trying to, 
um, just to make, make people, people aware, aware that we're we have these $35,000 costs or $100,000 costs that come up at the end of the year and we need to find a place, we need to figure out how to fund them. Otherwise, like you said, there was a time period where our curriculum was kind of stagnant because we didn't have the funds, which, you know, isn't beneficial. We, we can't grow and continue to succeed if we're stagnant. Well, and based on what we just voted for a budget, I think it becomes harder at the end of the year to hope to that you're going to have money to do this correct, type sure. of thing. So right. yeah. the money that we cut were in that one-time money, for example, that's right. one-time money that we paid towards things like this. Right. So. right. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, Sue, you're going to present um, accountability data sure. um, on achievement. You'll be updating us. So you got an email a while back and maybe a repeat of it from Diane recently on uh, trends <coughs> over the last five years for grade level by grade level. And we're, so you, you had that information, you've had it, and we've looked at it a, at a different way in this report. So, And we also looked at our accountability uh, because our accountability scores came out with our comparable districts a, a bit ago. Um, the interesting thing is we, I think people always want to know how we scored in MCAS, and I don't really know that everybody asks the right questions about why we're looking at those scores and what they can tell us. Um, so they can tell us how a student's achievement in Longwood was measured um, by MCAS scores changing over the years. How is it changing over the years? Is it, is it going up? Is it going down? Is it stagnant? Um, are overall scores on the rise or the decline? If so, what are the factors that may contribute to this that we should continue or cease? Are there persistent patterns of student achievement between grade levels in Long Meadow? How do those patterns compare to the state? And what are the achievement characteristics of class cohorts as they pass through the grades in Long Meadow? You know, you, you hear teachers say, oh, it's, uh, you know, this class is incredibly strong, they're going through it at a really high rate. What are those characteristics that we want to kind of infuse on, cl on cl other classes? So we, we need to look at it that way. What MCAS is not good for is um, targeted instruction because we don't get scores back in a, in a timely manner and we can't look at um, that and say okay we need to shore our student up in this area because he or she did poorly in that area. So the state measures accountability by a progress and performance index and you probably all got your students scores. Um, the state goal is to reduce the proficiency gap by half between the 2010-2011 MCAS data and next year's MCAS data. Uh, the gap is the difference between the 2011 Composite Performance Index CPI and a CPI of 100. It's split into five different levels. I'll show you that in a little bit. Uh, progress and Performance Index of 75 or higher indicates a school or district is on target for meeting the gap narrowing goals. Uh, the annual PPI is based on data from two years, and the cumulative PPI is based on data from at least three and generally four years. And you won't see PPI calculated for groups of students who are 25 or less, so um, ELL students, potentially some special education students in this district you may not see a PPI for. So if a district or a school is level one, that means we are meeting our PPI gap narrowing goals. Level two, we are not meeting them. Um, for, for an aggregate or a high or low need student, less than 90, or there's less than 95% MCAS participation. A level three is among the lowest 20% of schools or subgroups or less than 90% of MCAS participation. Um, four is among the lowest achieving, lowest achieving and five are chronically underperforming. Lots of kids don't take them, don't show up for the test, those kinds of things. <coughs> and uh, here's the CPI conversion table. So you get um, between zero and 100 points per student and then that's changed into a composite for the group of students. And those are the scores. We've all seen this before, but if you only see it once a year, it's hard to remember it. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to look at student growth percentiles this time around. And they are really a good way to measure a student's individual growth as they compare changes in a student score relative to changes in the scores of students with similar scores across the state in prior years. 
Uh, these are the groups of students who are measured by MCAS, all students together, high need students, economically disadvantaged students, students with disabilities, ELLs, and up to seven racial and ethnic subgroups. Sue, so can I just ask a question? Is, um, <laughs> my question is, are this within the subgroups, mm -hmm. Student, can students be classified in more than one subgroup? They can be, but they can't be counted twice. Okay. They, they're not counted twice. So students with disabilities are, are going to show up in the high needs students category also. But as far as calculating scores, overall they're not. They're not counted twice. Okay. So every year, uh, the state looks at districts that are similar to us so that we can compare <coughs> and see how we're doing. Um, we looked at the districts that are most similar in terms of grade span, uh, total enrollment, and similar in terms of populations. And I don't know if you can see that very well, sorry. Um, this year, most of our comparable districts took the park, so we don't have a ton of data to look at to compare. The orange shaded is us. I'm sorry. We're, yeah. And the blue shaded is the highest performing among the 10. We all took the park. But the majority of them took park, yes. Wow. Yeah. Do you know in the state what the percentage that took park? That's a good question. Was? Yeah. I know this year a lot more have gone no, to park. A lot more. But yeah. I thought it was in the 60% range, but I'm not sure. I don't know either. And we don't know if they took park paper, park computer based. I mean, it's kind of a crosswalk, but it's not really fair to do a comparable district on that. Yeah. So we're going to lose a lot of data with this whole park, like comparison <laughs> data, with with this whole. Well, if we well with the new MCAS, we'll all be on the same page again. So every now now that we have choices, we're we're losing we're not losing data, but, but the, the park districts are kind of yeah. But they're changing the MCAS next year and adding the park questions to it, so that's going to skew the data as well. So there'll be a couple of years where the data is yeah. not going to give you the yeah. information that you need. Right. It'll be like starting with the first year of MCAS again. The so first we'll formal be, year of MCAS. So we'll be more reliant as a district on our AIMS web scores or to help us uh, on our authentic assessments, yeah, to help us plan right. We sh we should be doing that anyway. <laughs> Okay, so Blueberry Hill is a level two school. Um, in the all students category, we met the target. Uh, in the high needs, we improved, but we are still below target. And then students with disabilities, they're declined. So um, you have to meet your target in all the areas in order to be a level one. So center is also a level two, although they improved. Wolf Swamp is level two, and the majority of the schools in the state are level two schools. Which doesn't mean it's okay. All improvements at Wolf Swamp, but not high enough to meet the target, unfortunately. Both of our middle schools are a level one. And they declined, oh. but they're still. They're still. They're still with target. it. Yeah. Yeah. And no, it's on uh, two years. Of data, so. So the prior. Yeah, <laughs> there's a little wiggle room there. Williams moved up to a level one, and Longmeadow High School's been at a level one for as far as I can remember. Mm -hmm. I think. Could you go back to Williams for a second? I can. So they have one decline as well. Yeah. But not enough to. Based on last yeah, year's. Yeah, based down. on last year's, yeah. Okay. And it's such a small group that a little, you know, a little, a small fluctuation can mean a big, yeah. big percentage. So we looked at the student growth percentiles, or I wanted to look at that over the over the last five years since you already have the other data, um, which which pretty much shows a fairly consistent MCAS achievement score. So again, these are scores that are compared to similar students. So these, these students are being compared to similar students across the state. 
and how they've done over the years. And the, sorry about my upside down graph, I couldn't get to life in me, but the, the red is the median student growth, and then um, percent proficient or higher is the blue. And then the, the lighter lines behind, the light blue and the light red, the light pink there, those are trend lines that show overall if the, you're trending up, staying, nor, you know, staying level or going down. And again, five years is not a ton of data points, but it's interesting to look at the trend lines where I would encourage you to keep an eye on those. So this is fourth grade ELA. So this is all of our? All, all, all students, all students, yep. Fifth grade ELA. And you can see you can actually uh, have a kind of a flat line in a, gro a growth percentile and um, an increase in proficiency or the other way around, depending on scores from prior years. So we're just completely flat in sixth grade. <laughs> I, yeah, notice, you have to kind of the look at... when you're, you score high, it's very hard for a district like ours to go higher. Mm -hmm. um, we couldn't go much higher in some of the scores. Mm -hmm. English or employment going fast enough. And one, of, one of the oddballs that fluctuated some. And when you're in the 90s, proficient. that's all good. Grade 10, look at the growth percentile, how high. Mm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Math. We did have a dip last year. Some nice growth in both. <coughs> That's particularly nice. There's an example of a higher score in a growth percentile and a lower, a lower trend line and profession or higher scores. So what we can gather from some of that MKS data is that uh, Longmeadow students continue to score above state averages. Um, Longmeadow achievement patterns parallel very closely those of the state at a higher level. I think we looked at that at one point, too. We looked at the state percentage of advanced and proficient relative to ours, and it was almost the same kind of pattern. We were just scoring about 20 points higher. Um, at most grade levels, ELA and math scores remain fairly consistent when measured uh, and averaged over time, which is what you were noting, Russ, if you flatline. Uh, at fourth grade, in ELA and math students demonstrate peaks and valleys over the years. They're up and they're down there more than any other grade. Um, and math scores vary from grade to grade and year to year more than ELA scores. And I gave you a couple of web addresses that you can check on accountability terms and measures that will that's a great read, <laughs> just so you know what all the initials stand for and the acronyms. And then you, I'm, I'm thinking you've all been on the profile page, but there's some pretty interesting information on the profile page, too, that you can get. So. Questions, comments, concerns? Um, do, the, do the scores go to colleges? MCAS scores? I think they do. I think they do. Who's got a college? Okay. <laughs> I think yeah. all of the transfers. Like the transfers. <clears throat> okay. Oh, and um, sorry. <clears throat> um, is the information, is this more to help you see um, like how the teachers are doing and how they should change their instruction or is it more for you to see the students and like where, I, I know you said like it's, you can't go back and say that they, you know, because the scores don't come Yeah, you can't give targeted year. student instruction right. based on the MCAS necessarily. But, like, you can maybe target in the next year. Mm -hmm. you, if, if, if classes fell down across the board in certain areas, then, yeah, that, that is a skill to target the next year across the board. So, mm -hmm. say, open response grade four was really low across the board, then we would target that area for all of grade four for next year. Um, right. Principals can look at their <clears throat> teacher data, and if you know someone's performing particularly high and kids are doing really well year after year in that class, it's a good class to make a model classroom out of, to have other teachers visit, to see what you know what things are doing in their 
that are having the kids get such high, you know, high marks. So there's a, there are ways to use the data, just not really kid specific, kid friendly. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, do you feel that people tend to use it to like place blame on bad scores, and therefore it's like the teacher's fault? Do you know what I mean? No, I haven't heard any no. of that. No. Okay. No. I, I just don't want that to be the impression of, yeah. like, my kids' scores went down, it must be the teacher. No. Okay. No. no. Now, Sue, piggybacking on kind of what Liz said, so if you notice, because I know you get the results over the summer and early fall mm -hmm. is when admin is reviewing all of them and really delving into it. Mm -hmm. So if you see that, say, grade four open response the previous year, you know, as a district, we really fell. And I know you just said that it. you then look at targeting instruction in that for the current grade four. Do we also look at doing anything for those students who had taken it in grade four who are now in grade five and help in any additional um, yeah. practice or yeah, that's help? That's probably or more of what happens, actually. So okay. first we look at the results of the state overall to see if this is an anomaly. Everybody in grade four fell down on open response last year. It's clearly an issue not related to the kids, you know. So that's the first place to go to. And right. then the second place is yes. So last year's fourth graders or this year's fifth graders, those are the students that will be targeted for that instruction. In fact, we did that uh, uh, at Wolf Swap School last year, and scores rose really nicely. So, so not looking at that data, but the other data we had in our packet okay. for MCAS. Um, I would tend to agree that they're kind of all over. I mean, some of some of the data, but I did notice that grade three in school. ELA. So center, the last couple of years has really kind of gone up quite a bit in the advanced category. Yeah. And also grade three math. Yeah, they've done nicely the last couple of years. Especially sure. grade three math. Mm -hmm. um, and then looking at Wolf Swamp too, grade three math has improved dramatically really over that five year span. All three schools have good, you know, good scores overall. But I was wondering if there's any, do we have any idea what happened in center in particular for math, let's say? Because they went up to 80% one year and advanced for math third grade. And the next next year they were, what, 60 something, 67, I think. We looked at that two years ago. Yeah. We noticed that, and they mm -hmm. put the, the, we were told they were gonna be sharing what was going on at center school with the other schools. If several years, Don has been working on that. Um, they did a, a complete analysis of the MCAS. They looked at questions. They looked whether they were open response, um, multiple choice, short answer, and they targeted those areas where the students did well, didn't do well. With the MCAS, you can also hone in on was it um, math facts or was it computation, was it uh, word, uh, word problems, things like that. So there's been an intense study in both areas, and Donna has, has, has teams working on that for years. Are they sharing that, that, I don't know, method, that they're, style? They're getting to grade, the together by grade school? level, by teachers, yes. They actually have one coming up for the math. The principals meet, and yep. they, they definitely discuss this. And but we also the, piloted the math programs last year, and um, so that may have made a difference in this year's MCAS. We had some pretty high-level math programs that kids were getting last year at, at every grade level. So it'll be interesting kind of to look back and see how those classrooms that piloted those programs scored relative to the programs that they had. Yeah, I mean, that's the only, when I looked through this, I couldn't really find a lot of all the, I mean, I thought that was useful because it does show that center is doing something yeah. that's really, seems to be working really well. Yeah. But then you look at fourth grade math and center in 2015 did quite a bit better than the other two schools, but the other years are very similar between all yeah, the schools. Because those fourth ELA. graders were the third graders from before. Yeah, so and you have, have yeah, right. You have to look at data over several data points mm -hmm. and, and to have it really be valid. Yeah, but that but, but if you see something spike really well, then you need to see what they're doing to 
Yeah. And then the other years, fifth grade, they're kind of all in a similar grouping, all the different schools. There's nobody, you know, there's nothing that really stands out there. But then sixth grade, I mean, it's, it doesn't look like any school is necessarily trending up, down. It's just, it's kind, just of kind of flat up line. and down over the years. And again, it doesn't take many students to get the bar to move up or down because the groups are smaller. Um, let's see, sixth grade. I mean, obviously their math was trending up, but then they had 2015 drop yep, a little bit. Drop. I mean, I tried to overlap the different schools just to see if there was anything oh. that you could find. Yeah. But, um, Glenbrook's seventh grade math <coughs> and Williams both kind of have been trending up pretty trending well. Up. Yep, and they just um, they got new text due a couple of years ago. Okay, so you're more that's aligned. Yep. And are these textbooks more aligned? Like, are they going to flow? Yes. And, from and yes. middle to. Yeah. So now so all eight, of our math. Eighth grade meets with ninth grade so that they're on the same track as far as teaching the skills that they need to get into the ninth grade. They're all aligned. And so now our math will flow with everything that we've got from elementary to middle. Yes. Are they be the same same language? They'll be using the same. Yep. Yeah. And then middle to high school. Because I think, I think area, a couple years ago there was a little there. bit of disconnect between elementary and middle school. There was that. Well, in or between middle and high school, they've definitely met to kind of ease those transitions. How about Glenbrook's eighth grade math? That this year? increased pretty dramatically this year. Williams actually has been high in that area all along. Glenbrook basically just kind of bumped up to the same. And this is the, their second year with that math program. Okay. Or third, maybe. This might be their third. Maybe yeah, I think program. Third. Yeah. third year. So at the elementary level, because we just did math, we did the pilots, and now we right. have a new right. program. You'd expect that that should see some results, and hopefully. Yes. Because now they're all doing the same thing. Now they're all doing the same thing across the board, getting math the same way. Yeah, especially the younger kids. The kids are going in. We're getting it from the, the ground up. They all have the same um, assessments, mm -hmm. the same curriculum. Yeah, they're all doing no. common assessments in all three. So what are we doing for pairing e and what are we doing for ELA? Because those are really some of the. Uh, for, we have a balanced literacy program for ELA, and we use uh, books, trade books for ELA, and we do mini lessons and writers workshop and readers workshop. So, do we? Uh, it's not a, it's not a text. It's not a, yeah, not a basal reader. Kids are picking literacy off the shelves and learning from that. Is there some sort of common assessment for ELA across each grade too, so that we know at the end of the lit coaches grade. are working on common assessments? It's a little more challenging because the literacy books are not the same across the board, so it's kind of like an open writing response or things like that. But yes, there are. So they're, they're working, working on, on that right yeah, now. Math has their common assessments are using the end of unit reviews for those. And as far as the science and technology in fifth grade. Are they work? The new science will. will this give this them is a year for aligning science standards. This year and next year. So the elementary committee has been working really hard to get those standards aligned. The new math standards just got approved. Now they have to look at the national standards and the and the math standards and look at them together. And they're working on that. So they meet tomorrow or Wednesday on that. So that's another area where center grade three ELA. It looks like the last two years. All the schools are kind of grouped together in ELA in third grade, except mm -hmm. for the last two years, Center um, has really pulled ahead. Had pretty good scores, yeah. 14, 15. Is there anything that's occurring there that we could model, or, or are they all basically doing the same? They're all doing about the same thing. The literacy coach at Center has really made a huge push to get into a lot of classrooms at Center and do model lessons and things like that. So. Um, without saying for sure, but that is something that's really, really happening with Gusto at Center, and the other okay. two, I think, are moving towards that. But I, I think that one thing that could be shared is the teacher's dedication to looking at the data. Um, Donald certainly leads the effort, but the teams of teachers have really analyzed that thoroughly, and I think that maybe if 
we did a little bit more training on how teachers could delve into that. It, it could make a greater impact to the other two schools as well. Yeah. Um, I, I think when you talk to teachers at center, they, they can hone right in on where the problems were the following year, uh, and they make adjustments to their instruction to make, make improvements. Yeah, and I know sometimes it's also partially based on what happened the prior year, and so you mm -hmm. can't really look at grade level by grade level necessarily that easily, but yeah. but those are the trends I noticed. I don't know if anybody noticed anything else. but I think it's hard, too, that um, a lot of the ELA portion is more subjective rather than objective because of the amount of open response and the weight that's put on open response and how they're graded differently. Whereas the math, yes, there are some open response questions, but you, you know, it, otherwise it's pretty standard either, you know, math is right or it's wrong, whereas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you would think. <laughs> uh, that, that, Being a science yeah, person, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's more black and white than ELA is. Um, you know, in terms of writing and mm -hmm. and what the the people are looking for in terms of the, the graders are looking for of what <coughs> makes a you know the scale of what it is. And I it's just also more subjective to be graded. Yeah. Right. So you're most of the questions in math are you you have the answer or you don't. Although <coughs> the questions are very language based themselves, so you have to be a good reader in order to do well. Right. Math. Right. No, I wasn't meaning but that, but the answer part of it is yeah. you know. Two plus two is going to be four, no matter which, you know, bubble you fill in, which method you use to get there. Whereas, you know, writing about your interpretation of, of a passage and, and showing mm -hmm. justification and referencing back and all of that, that's more of a subjective. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I, I think I know my second grader and my fourth grader, they're always coming home with what their reading level is and their writing level and all the kids, everybody in the class knows apparently oh. each other's. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I it's would imagine that practice. all that testing gives you a pretty good idea how they're going to do on MCAS. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. so you're right though. It is, There's generally not a lot of surprises. It is subjective, yeah. but it's also if you're a couple of grade levels ahead, then you're probably going to do okay gonna, on MCAS. You're going to be advanced on MCAS. <coughs> <coughs> Yeah, but I think, Russ, your point is well taken, is, and, and Kim too, is those who are excelling at, at whatever school, you know, to be using those to collaborate with their grade level partners in other schools to, to share and, and use those ideas across the board, mm -hmm. definitely. And we've, yeah, we've been, I mean, we've seen center schools excel with their math in third grade for the last two years. I mean, we've talked about it probably three or four different times. So I would assume they're already sharing their practices with the other schools by now, and those are hopefully being They've all met several put times. into place so that we can see some of those growths at the other schools. Yeah, the, the only odd thing, which I was expecting to see but didn't really, because I've never kind of put it all together like this, but then you look at fourth and fifth and sixth, and you don't necessarily see that continuation. Like at Center or Blueberry or Wolf Swamp, that that continues. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it did and sometimes, sometimes it didn't. Yeah. Well, so we've only seen it for two years, and you see it in third grade at Center, and you see it in fourth grade at Center. Yeah, but you didn't see it the prior year. And you're not just you're not two years you're ago. not looking at the same cohorts there either. Mm -hmm. Kind of want to look at the same cohort. Look, look at the growth, the growth scores. I guess if you want your best measure of continual kind of progress. The thing is you can't look year by year either because kids move in, kids move mm -hmm. out, and it's not that many kids that makes a difference as yeah. far as right. changing. You're going to get some stuff. variation, yeah. Well, so does the test change every year? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, how yeah. can you even compare at all? Yeah. And I think the looking at the big picture is by the time we get to 10th grade, all of our students, no matter where they went to school, for elementary or middle, all of our students are excelling at the high school level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, MCAS is really better for a big picture. I mean, you're right, you can't compare one year to the next or even three years. But I will say, I mean, I've been looking at this, you know, since we moved in the last time to Long Island. And there was a big divergence in the scores back then. So that was maybe 10 or 15 years ago. But 
you could see there was a difference between different schools. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is it's narrowed. It's so when I put this all together, the score is none of them really stand out as, oh my God, that really school is so much better than the other one. Yep. You know, and you did see that before. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was the score, even at the middle one school One middle level. school was very popular. And, and the elementary too, it mm -hmm. was that way. But yeah. fortunately it's become more similar. It's just a question of how do we take the best in particular grades and look at what they're doing well. And well you look at professional development day a little different than we have been looking at it and you know instead of bringing people in to speak on one topic one time you look about collaboration and PD so we're trying to head in that direction. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Are we going to be using the projector? No. Okay. No. I'll share this with you guys. Let's record. Okay, thanks. Maya, you're up for new educator evaluation data. There's a um a packet in your folder that says forward on the desktop 126.16. It's the educator evaluation performance rating for Longmeadow. And if you open up the packet to the third page, yes, it will give you the ratings. What they've done is um, the state's beginning to collect data on how people are evaluated, <coughs> both administrators, teachers, and then they combine them. And they tell you how many were exemplary, how many were proficient, how many were um, needs improvement, and how many um, were failing. And this just breaks down Longmeadow's data for you. So you can see that um, all educators, there are 290 that were evaluated, which is 100% of the people who work in the district. 29% were exemplary, 70% were proficient, 1% um, needs improvement, and 03 were unsatisfactory. And then it, it breaks it down further for you for administrators, teachers, um, teachers with professional status, and teachers with non-professional status. So I'll ask if you have any questions on this. Yeah, this is the new evaluation system that has been started. It's not fully implemented yet, is it? It's fully implemented. The, um, the teachers had, a, had an evaluation committee comprised of the association representatives, teachers, administrators, and we came up with the teacher tool. The administrators use the same model that I use that comes out of the DESE, so we're evaluated on professional practice, student learning, and district improvement. The teachers is a very rigorous, lengthy evaluation tool that all the principals use, so they, they're using the same um, evaluation tool for all the teachers. And was there a... Um a parent or student input section? I, I thought that not was yet. That's part. coming out. Okay, so that's the part that's not been. That, I guess that's what I was referring to. Is that's not been implemented no, yet? No, Sue's working on that this year. Lucky you. <laughs> so I know the state has. I don't know what they're calling it. Targets maybe mm -hmm. for how many fall in exemplary proficient needs improvement. And I think exemplary is usually around 10, 15. I don't like recall. Yeah, oh. something. Somewhere in that area, I think. Um, in particular with non-professional status, I believe. Not that we have to follow their standards, but I noticed that we're well above those numbers. It may just be we have very good teachers. We have outstanding teachers. Yeah, I hope. Um, and I'm sure they are, based on the scores we just looked at. I mean, that would be the reason for it. Um, but is there any, has the state said anything to us about that as far as our percentages or the numbers or, I don't think they dictate any of that. I think it's simply a recommendation is my understanding. I think it's recommendations. I, I do think we have outstanding teachers. We hire well. We have people that have high degrees, people that are very dedicated to excellence. So I would expect Longmeadow, because we are such a high achieving district, to see more teachers that are exemplary and proficient. I think we're also, um, very good about taking action early when people do, they're not a good fit for Longmeadow, so that they're evaluated out at an early stage. So I, I think you, you would see that difference. And we probably get some non-professional status teachers that have already worked somewhere else that aren't. We do, brand quite new. a few. Yeah. Have we compared these to that, the cohort that we have for MCAS data? I haven't. I did look at our region. 
and we there were some in the region that were much much higher than us and there were some that were much much lower than us but okay. I didn't look at our like districts I just did the region okay well it's good to see the teachers are doing so well so that's <coughs> definitely definitely a good thing when you visit the classrooms you'll see that this is probably a really accurate re reflection because we go through on walkthroughs frequently and the teaching really is outstanding we're, we're most fortunate to have an extraordinary staff. That's why a lot of us move here. So. Any other questions or comments about the evaluation data? <clears throat> All right. Seeing none, I'll move on to warrants. Okay. To remind everybody our finance subcommittee did not meet since our last meeting. Where are they? Okay. Um, let's see. I move that the school committee approve the warrant batch number 2200 of the school lunch, lunch FY16 fund dated February 26, 2016, in the amount of $74,148.56. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? And last, um, I move that the school committee approve the warrant batch number 3100 <clears throat> of the general fund FY16 fund dated February 26, 2016 in the amount of $322,446.73. A second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? <clears throat> we do have a consent agenda. Um, for one overnight field trip request. So if I could have a motion. Um, I move on the recommendation of the superintendent that the school committee approve the overnight field trip request for students from Longmeadow High School to travel to Springfield, Mass. on Friday, April 8, 2016 through Sunday, April 10, 2016. We have a motion. Do we have a second? A second. <coughs> second. All those in favor? Okay. And we do not have any minutes for approval for this meeting. Sorry. So nope. that's fine. Nope. Um, so unless anybody has anything else that they would like to bring up, I would um, entertain a motion to adjourn into executive session. I move that the school committee adjourn into executive session for the purpose of discussing strategy as it relates to collective bargaining with the nurses and pending litigation not to reconvene into open session. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All right. That will require a roll call vote. Aye, Liz. Janet, aye. Aye, Kim. Michelle, Kim. aye. Russell Dupere, aye. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening, and we will see you back here um, in March. <laughs>